So welcome to this Miao seminar with Alexander Nadel, who will introduce us to the Intel fat solvers. Um, thanks for, for coming, Alexander. Please take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Jakob. So uh, we will start from the very beginning, what SAT is about, then um, gradually we'll go deeper. So the SAT problem is uh, the problem of determining if a Boolean formula in conjunctive normal form is satisfiable. So here we have a, a, an example of such a formula. So we have uh, variables A, B, and C, Boolean variables, literals A, B, not A, not B, or C. And the literal is a variable or its negation. We have two clauses, just junctions of literals here. And finally, we have uh, the formula F, which is a conjunction of these clauses. Now, this fact is the original MP complete problem. There is the famous Cook Levin theorem. So it has an exponential complexity unless P is equal to MP. And um, and thus P is equal to NP and thus SAT is frequently called the most important allostatic equation in computer science. So that's why SAT is important. And you can even grab one mil one million dollar if you can solve it theoretically whether P is equal to NP or not. Uh, but in addition to the theoretical side, it's also being widely used. So here are some examples from the program of the CAP conference uh, last year. So there was a talk harnessing the power of formal verification for the uh, trillion dollar chip design industry. So formal verification is sub based and uh, we're speaking here about our chip in the industry. And another talk, uh, so that talk was given by Ziad Khan from Cadence, uh, which is an EDA company. And there was also a talk by Neha Rungte from Amazon, a billion SMT queries a day, uh, which tells about how Amazon are using uh, SMT solves, which are sub based. And another example from the industry is um, my own example, our own example from Intel. So on the left hand side, you can see the cut flow, the general cut flow, all the way from system specification to chip production. And uh, there are many stages here. One of the stages is physical design. Physical design, essentially, you place your transistors, then you connect them, you round, round them. And it's also um, it's using uh, several sub stages. And, uh, we are using SAT for placement, for clock synthesis, for, for routing, so for several of the SAT stages of uh, physical design. Of course, it's also used in, not only in the industry, uh, there is this famous uh, paper talking uh, you know, about generating the largest math proof. Uh, so this is a very well-known paper. Um, how do you, you solve SAT? Uh, Pythagorean triple problem with SAT. Okay, so that was just an introduction into SAT. The, uh, Fundamental algorithm in SAT is backtrack search. It's it's called DPLL or DLL, and it was invented in the early 60s. And let me show how you go from a basic solution enumeration into DPLL. So we have the same formula. Assume we want to, to, to solve it, and the, the, the easiest way to solve it would be building this um, enumeration, full enumeration. So you have uh, variables on the vertices, then you just enumerate enumerate all the possible combinations. So in this case, there are to the, to the three, eight combinations. And for example, uh, zero, 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 does not satisfy the formula because the first clause is falsified. But zero, one, zero does satisfy the formula. So green means it satisfies the formula, red leaves means it doesn't. So zero, one, zero satisfies the formula. The first clause is satisfied with B is equal to one. And uh, the next one is satisfied. So the last one essentially satisfied with uh, A is equal to zero. Okay. So this is the simplest way to solve that formula, but of course it's not efficient because you have, you have an exponential tree. Now, uh, how can you improve it? So that was discovered already in the original DPLL. So first of all, you can stop when a certain clause turns unsat. So in this case, you stop here because A and B are false. So the first clause is unsat. And that, that's the whole formula is unsat. And another improvement is just inst instead of enumerating everything, you can just um, uh, carry out backtrack search and stop when the model is found. So you would pick a variable A, for example, choose a value, variable B, choose a value. Now we have a conflict because first clause is falsified. So we backtrack, flip the value of B, and pick the next variable C, and uh, here we assign C0. This is a model. So we found a satisfying assignment, a model to the formula by backtrack search. And uh, now the last uh, improvement 
present already in the original DPLL I want to talk about is unit clause propagation. So a unit clause is a clause in which one of the literals is unassigned and the rest are falsified. And the unit clause rule is about just un, uh, assigning unassigned literals in unit clauses, the value one. So, uh, and that unassigned literal must be implied in the clause in order to satisfy it because you want to satisfy all the clauses and, and, and there's only one option left here. So modern such solvers apply the unit clause rule till fixed point. This is known as the uh, Boolean constraint propagation process. So in this case, we would start with A, assign it zero, for example, and then B would be implied and close the first clause in this case, it must be one. Then uh, C would be chosen and uh, we would find the same model, but uh, we saved a decision here using Boolean constraint propagation. So this is DPLL essentially. But DPLL could handle formulas with uh, you know, a small number of clauses, 2000 or less, but uh, whereas modern such solvers can cope with huge industrial entities, reaching even into the hundreds of, of millions of clauses. So how come? Um, and the introduction of conflict-driven closure of CDCL SAT solving was the birth of modern highly scalable SAT solving. And the idea there is to learn from conflicts to drive and prune backlog search. So whenever there is a conflict, you, you can learn a new clause and also update your heuristics accordingly, and, and it really helps. So that's the idea. Uh, so the principles of CDCL are, uh, include learning and pruning. In order to block all these explored subspaces, there is the principle of locality, focus the search on the relevant data. So if you if you can extract something relevant from the current context, you know you do it. That's what the SAT solvers do. Otherwise, you would be lost. Then there are well-engineered data structures, uh, extremely fast Boolean constraint propagation. And beyond CDCL, there is also in-processing. So you can simplify the formula on the fly and recently also local search integration. So that's why uh, CDCL, CDCL SAT solvers work, or modern SAT solvers work, work so well, essentially, on, even on huge formats. Now, uh, some of you may have seen this picture, some, some of you generated it, essentially. But so uh, it is well known that there was a tremendous progress in non incremental SAT solving. So uh, uh, these two pictures um, show progress on, on two back search, uh, benchmark suits of a, uh, SAT competition 19 and 20. And so you can see each line here corresponds to one solver. Here, all the solvers are essentially the winners of SAT competition starting from 2002 to, to, to um, 2020. And you can see that the 2020 winner key set can solve, uh, so on the right hand, uh, exits, you can see the number of benchmarks it can solve, so it can solve much more benchmarks than the others. So you can see there was progress, and there was progress every year uh, on non-incremental SAT solving instances, instances using, used during SAT competition. However, uh, many of the applications do not use non-incremental solving, but require incremental SAT solving under assumptions, and so there is this uh, famous flow. Um, so, uh, this is the API for incremental SAT solver. So it includes just two functions, add clause, add close, which just adds the close, and then solve under the assumptions that all the literals in A hold. And output of a single solve uh, is as follows. SAT, if all the clauses so far, the formula F, and the current set of assumptions is satisfied, um, other, otherwise it's unsat. And um, it's a very nice and, and, and useful API. It allows the user to add a set of clauses temporarily. So what's one uh, of the things you can do? Uh, it can be done using a new selector or activation variable. Uh, to add a clause CI, for example, you, you just uh, add that variable S to CI, and you uh, and then you can use add clause to update the SAT solver with this uh, new clause and solve formula under the assumption. So you add the assumption not S, and by that, you um, make that close count for the current invocation, and then you can uh, later remove it. Okay, so that's very, very useful in practice. And uh, so it was invented by the authors of Minisat, and it's definitely a breakthrough. It's extremely easy to use and very efficient because the solver retains the conflict clauses and heuristical data. And it's widely used in, in hardware and software validation and SAT-based optimization, including Maxat. 
And also in my personal industrial experience, uh, this is extremely useful. I, I don't think I have any non-incremental application, actually. And then there was a paper. Uh, a question about this. Yes. So just, yes. I don't know if it's premature to ask, but could you say anything about where these, like where do the clauses come from and the assumptions? Like how does the problem evolve to encompass like new clauses and new... Uh, yeah, it, it depends on, 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 on the input problem, essentially. So, uh, for example, in, in bounded model checking, you have a circuit and you uh, unroll it. And then every new invocation of the subsolver, uh, you kind of unroll the formula, and then you give this new information to the subsolver. And uh, in Maxit, for example, you uh, may want to send uh, the subsolver. For example, in Maxit, if you find a satisfying assignment, and then you want to improve it, so you block it uh, with a new clause. And then to, you can reinvoke the stats over to have a new solution, right? In in optimization flows. So it really depends on the flows. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, so uh, here I uh, wanted to mention this paper. So there was a paper several years ago at SAT, and it was shown there that there is no performance progress for various incremental applications. Um, so in, in the last decade or so, uh, the solver glucose was shown to be largely on par with the leading solver at, at that time on, on three applications. One is satisfiability-based Maxat, where Maxat is uh, optimizing, um, it is an, uh, optimizing a, a SAT formula when you have um, a linear function to optimize. So we'll talk about it a bit later. So, uh, so glucose was shown to be on par with the leading solver on satisfiability-based Maxit with mostly rapid SAT queries, unsatisfiability-based Maxit, another approach to Maxit with mostly rapid unsat queries, and then minimal unsatisfied uh, core extraction, mixed queries. And uh, they also showed that none of the five latest techniques, which improve non-incremental SAT, uh, have significant impact on incremental SAT, right? So there was a, a tremendous progress for, for non-incremental SAT, but not on those applications. Incremental applications, and I have my own experience at Intel that there was no progress on industrial optimization problems, which I am dealing with, including the placement problem, and so also, and also some other problems. And so, and then at that point, uh, I decided to uh, design a new set solver. So all that was just uh, you know, an introduction of why um, I decided to write a new set solver. Uh, so the new set solver is called Intel Sat Solver or Intel Sat. It's an open source CDCL SAT solver written from scratch in C20, and it is optimized towards incremental applications with mostly satisfiable queries. Uh, in the paper, which I published last year at SAT, I showed that uh, it works well for any time unweighted MAXAT, which is a satisfiability based MAXAT. And uh, also, I'm, we are now actively using it for some industrial applications, uh, essential optimization problems, placement, scheduling, and some other problems. Uh, so there is a public repository. You can you know download it, compile it, play with it, and do with it whatever you want. Uh, now I must tell you that my initial plan was just you know writing a SAT solver, and and you know publishing it something that would work really efficient in practice. But then I found myself uh, digging into the theory and dealing with some problems in in backtracking, which I just, I just couldn't understand how things work. And so and then I had to really like dive into uh, the principles of the CDCL algorithm and at the watch list and how they work together. So, um, and uh, so I'll talk about it later. So I think that most interesting result is even not the SAT solver itself, but this, this uh, you know, theoretical observations. Okay, so, uh, so the concepts, the concepts behind Intel SAT are as follows. So there is incremental lazy backtracking. So um, uh, I've described this incremental SAT flow. So you have uh, incremental queries to the solver. And the idea here in incremental lazy backtracking ILB is to backtrack only when necessary. So uh, most of the solvers uh, backtrack to decision level zero, just undo all the assignments um, before the next incremental query. Intel SAT solver backtracks only when necessary in, and to the highest possible level. Because you, you don't really want to backtrack if you if you are waiting, if you anticipate a quick, satisfiable call. You want to be as close to, as possible to, to 
Like to as you want to have as many variables assigned as possible. And then there is this new core SAT algorithm I call reimplication. It can reimply assigned literals at lower levels without backtracking. It enables uh, incremental lazy backtracking. And also independently of, uh, of that, it restores two core uh, BCP invariants broken by chronological backtracking. Another feature is that the trail, the variable trail is implemented is doubly linked list rather than stack to facilitate chronological backtracking and, re and reimplication. Uh, there are no pointers, it's an efficient area-based implementation. There are also some heuristics and uh, the algorithms and heuristics are generic. They can be used uh, uh, in other such solvers and in applications. So these are the concepts. concepts. Now, um, now I'm going to tell you a bit how uh, the basic city cell works in GRASP and in CHAF. And then I will discuss uh, what problems there are um, in modern implementation of these algorithms. And then we'll get to Intelsat Solver, how Intelsat Solver tries to solve these problems. Okay. So there are very, two very well known seminal works about city cell SAT solving. Uh, first about GRASP and second about CHAF. Uh, now I'm going to show you, oh, first I'm going to talk a bit about Boolean constraint propagation, and then I'll show you how CHAF and GRASP work. Uh, and then we'll go ahead to other more, more modern solvers. So BCP consumes uh, a large amount of uh, SAT runtime. And what it does is identify and propagate with unit clauses. This is essential for performance because you want to identify all the unit clauses. And then it must also identify and report any conflicts. This is essential for correctness because if, if you are now in a branch with a conflict, you must backtrack, right? You cannot go on for correctness. And it does so by uh, associating a watch list with every literal. Uh, it contains all the clauses where the literal is watched. And the, when the literal is falsified, all the clauses in the watch list of the negation of that literal are visited. So let me show you how it works. So graph just watched all the literals. So whenever a literal got, got assigned false, uh, all the clauses in which it appeared or its negation appeared were visited. But then um, the author of the Sato, Satsovo, Han Tao Zhang, uh, found that essentially it is sufficient to watch two non-falsified literals. But if two literals in a clause are non-falsified, so they're either, uh, either satisfied or unassigned, then the clause cannot be unit, nor can it be a conflict clause, not, not can, can it be falsified. That was a very important observation, and uh, he implemented it in his solver Sato. But, um, in Sato, there was order between the literals. So there were two watch literals, head and tail. All the literals to the left of head uh, have been fal falsified and to the uh, right of, of the tail. And in between, there could be uh, some uh, literals with unknown value. And um, the thing is that here, in order to implement back backtracking, you need to visit clauses. And then there was the next observation uh, by the authors of the Chaff Solver that if you wash the first two literals, always the first two literals, there is no need to visit the clause during backtrack. And that's what all the modern solvers are doing. So, uh, so the solvers just wash the first two literals in the clause. Um, so it is sufficient to watch the first literals if both are uh, satisfied or unassigned. If one of them is falsified, then also the decision level of that literal must be not lower than decision level of the other falsified literals in the rest of the clause in order to guarantee that the, the um, invariants hold after backtracking. And uh, the last improvement I wanted to mention here is that, mo that modern solvers cache one literal inside the watch list, one literal from the clause. And so if that literal is satisfied, you don't really need to visit the clause, which is great. So you save cache misses and uh, also uh, some of the solvers, including KISAT, uh, the baseline solver for uh, the winners of the latest uh, SAT competitions, inline binary clauses. So binary clauses do not appear in the generic pl uh, PLOS database, but they are inlined into the bushes. So this is BCP. Now I am going to talk about conflict analysis loop in CHAF and then in GRASP, and we'll, we'll compare them. So I'll do it on an example. On the left-hand side, we have a formula. And then I'll show you how CHAF operates, essentially. 
So it is a decision variable uh, or literal A, a decision level one, then it invo invokes BCP, but here we have nothing to propagate, so it goes ahead to uh, literal D, uh, nothing to propagate again, then C and D and E. And at this point, there are some unit clauses. So uh, F is implied at OC5, right? Then G is implied in uh, C3, because uh, C is one and F is one, thus G must be one here. And at this point, we have a conflict. Why is that? Because um, C4 becomes falsified. Now, when there is a conflict, um, I have a bar here which blocks me this part of the screen. Sorry. So um, what it does is um, it learns a falsified assorting clause. See, so uh, this is a new clause. The first literal of the clause must belong to the last decision level, uh, delta. The second literal is lower than delta, but higher than the all the other literals, or not lower than other literals in the clause. And all the all the literals are falsified. So this is a new clause. And in chat, this is the first UAP clause. And then it backtracks to level beta, uh, which is non chronological backtracking in shaft, and C becomes unit, and then it flips C1. So uh, let me show you how it works. Okay, so we have here the implication graph, which shows dependencies between literals. So for example, G was implied in, in close C3, uh, because C and F were assigned true, and now G must be assigned true. Right, and so we have here we, we just see the conflict, right? So um, both G and not G must be assigned, must be assigned, and thus there is a conflict. And the first UAP clause. Uh, so for generating the first UAP clause, we, we must have the conflict on the right hand side and the reason on the left hand side, including the rightmost unique implication point of the last level, which is a literal in the last level, uh, which is sufficient to imply the conflict. And there are also some literals connected from the previous levels. And so uh, chaff, because this close, not F, not C or not B, and backtracks non-chronologically level three. Because the next literal, assigned literal in C is in uh, C6 is literal C. So then it flips, not F, right, in C6. C6 implies not F. And then G is implied, there is the conflict, there is a new implication graph, a new first AP clause, F or not A, the solar backtrack non chronologically to decision level of A, decision level one, then it flips F. Okay, so that's the conflict analysis loop in CHAF. A, a very well known algorithm. Now let's go back to GRASP, what GRASP did. Uh, okay, so it's a bit more complicated. So the first step there is to backtrack to the conflict level delta. So in GRASP may explore, may find the conflict lower than the current decision level, unlike CHAF. And so the first step is backtracking to that level. The next step is learning, uh, again, first, first, the first UAP close, similar to CHAF, or rather CHAF took this idea from GRASP, but GRASP also learned some uh, other clauses, a, a clause for every other UAP other UAP the last level. Then, unlike Chubb, GRASP uh, backtracks to level delta minus one, which is called chronological backtracking in later literature. Although the authors of GRASP did not call it chronological backtracking, but now that's how it's called. And then it flips and implies C1. So let me show how it works uh, on the same example. So again, we pick a, a, a literal and another one, another one, and we just go to the same context here. Same application, same conflict. Now, uh, GRASP would learn the first UAP clause, and also the second UAP clause. Uh, but uh, I would like to highlight that the backtracking here would be to chron chronological backtracking to decision level four, unlike Chaff, right? So we backtrack decision level four. Here we flip the uh, F. And uh, in GRASP, it's, it's considered to be a, sp a special kind of a variable of a literal, flip literal, but uh, it handles 
GASP handles this literature as if it were applied at level three. So you see not F is implied at level three, although it is assigned after D, which is which was assigned at level four. And then uh, there is a conflict after, after implying G. And the first thing GASP would do is deleting after, uh, so after, let's say, learning, so sorry, yeah, GASP does not need to draw the implication graph, but never mind, it just backtracks to conflict level three. Because uh, uh, the conflict occurs at level, at level three, so it doesn't need the variable d, which is assigned to level four. That's it, backtracks. Okay, so this is the first step, which is not required for Chav, because in Chav such a situation is impossible. The conflict always occurs at the last decision level. So the reason, so, so the yeah. reason that you need to figure out the conflict level is precisely that you did this chronological backtracking. So that sort of yes. propagations are, I don't know, out of order, as it were. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. So uh, in GRASP, you can propagate everywhere at every decision level, and thus you can find the conflict at every decision level, not only at the last level, and thus you need to backtrack. And is it clear how to quickly see what, or I just, get, I mean, am I sure to get exactly the right level, or at least, you know, some level that might be lower than the current one, but might not also not be correct, because maybe you know, I have some propagation on the on on the trail, but it's actually the the conflict level is the wrong one. I yeah, could have propagated very, it earlier. Yeah, it's a very good question. We'll talk about it extensively, actually. But you may uh, find conflicts at you might may, may find a conflict at any level. So you may find a conflict at level twenty, although you also have a conflict at level ten. So, for example, Kisat uh, may find a conflict at level twenty, although there is a, a lower conflict. Then it will learn a conflict at level twenty and. Uh, Eventually, it will also learn the, the conflict at level 10. Okay, but it will take time. So, and uh, in Intel SAT, in this new SAT solver, I always learn the lowest conflict. So, that's one of the ideas there. But we'll get to it. In GRASP, uh, you could learn, uh, I mean, in GRASP and any other solver implementing Prolog code backtracking, which are, which is like almost all the modern solvers, I think. You may uh, learn conflicts at any level. Okay. So, uh, um, okay, so GRASP will continue. It would record a first UAP close and then uh, the, also the second UAP close because it's GRASP and it learns a close for every UAP. And then it would uh, backtrack chronologically to level two and uh, flip there. This is GRASP. So, so, so the, short, short, yes. short comment here. So I'm, I'm not sure about this because Karim makes other claims. So Karim says uh, this is Z chef what you're showing. No, no. This I yeah. I talked to Joao and eventually he agreed with me that this is what Grasp is doing. So uh, yeah. they they called no they called uh, this uh, first preliminary step backtracking to level uh, to conflict level. They called it uh, non chronological backtracking. So that's what, what non-chronological backtracking means in the grass paper, right? So, yeah, yeah, anyhow, so I just wanted to, 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 to say that like even Karem is kind of not sure about this and, and we, we know for sure that it's in Z-Chef, that's my point. No, but in, in Z-Chef there is chronological backtracking, you're saying? No, the, the, uh, the, the other way around, right? In CRASP there's actually uh, chronological backtracking. In, in GRASP, there is chronological backtracking. Yes. Oh, that's because what I'm saying. Would, yes, so that's why um, I would completely agree with you if you would replace GRASP by Z-Chef here, but I'm not sure about the GRASP part. And even Karen gives kind of comments in this direction. So I just want to make this comment sort of like, but but I I can ask Karen or we can ask Karen together again, so. I actually asked Joao, uh, Marcus Silva about this point. I have a long game of thread with him and eventually, he agreed that GRASP does what we now call chronological backtracking. Yes. But what it, I mean, but again, the author, but Joao and, and Karim called this first preliminary step of backtracking to the conflict level non chronological backtracking. But today there is no name to this step. So, okay. That's, so that's what, what at least I, how I understand it. But if you look into the, into the paper, you will see that it actually does chronological backtracking. I mean, in, yes, in the, the current, point is, 
my point is uh, this is more like a, of a historical question, right? Like what what they they do there in, in ninety something. Yes. And yeah. and since sort of like Zchef and uh, Linda was worked and uh, Minisat afterwards, like we're doing this uh, non chronological, right? That's that's the thing. No, the chaff does non chronological, for sure. But what I what I claim here is that grasp does chronological. Oh, okay, so then, 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 ah, okay, then, then I get your point. Oh, okay, sorry. So I, yeah. I was completely misled by this discussion with Karim. Yeah, yeah, okay, then, I, then I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. So, but what you're saying, like, if you're reading early papers, this preliminary step, which is what should we call it, conflict level determination or something? Yeah. That's was... like that. They would refer to that as non-chronological backjump. Yes, yes, exactly. And then the, the terminology shifted. And uh, and now we call this uh, like, you know, non-chronological backtracking is the step which we do after learning the conflict clause. And then backtrack to the second level in the clause. But the, the you know, Joao and, and Karim called you know, this preliminary step non-chronological backtracking. And now, do you want to explain, given that we do this chronological backtracking, Mm -hmm. How how is it that I can now get a propagation at like an earlier level than the current level? Do you just want to explain this again? There's a question in the chat about this. How you do propagation at the early, earlier level? No, how 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 come that because we, mm -hmm. we can now detect the propagation, like even if I'm at level 10, mm -hmm. I can detect the propagation at level five now, right? That's true. So you just you know go ahead and propagate in, in BCP. And if you discover, if you find a close, a unit close, you just assign the, you know, and there is an unassigned literal there, you assign it uh, the highest level in that close. Like you assign, you imply it at that close, at the level of that close. But as we, we shall see, so I will have many examples actually later, maybe we should, we should just wait. I will have examples that uh, there might be some, some implications in other closes at lower levels. But we just, you know, go ahead and and uh, and imply every literal in the first clause that can be implied in the first visited clause by BCP. Okay. So, but this okay. this only this only can happen after the first conflict, right? Not initially. Yes. After ah, the yeah, first. No, then it's clear. Then it's clear. Okay. okay thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So let's go ahead. So now, now let me summarize the up an up to date conflict analysis loop algorithm which covers grasp and chaff and also model solves. So there is this first step, backtracking before conflict analysis to the conflict level if required, right? So it wasn't part of chaff, for example, but uh, it was part of grasp. And also uh, in this new solver from Maple, which Maple with Corrosion of the could be implemented, there is this step. Um, okay. okay, so that was part of grasp, but not in chaff. Then there is this universal step of learning and assertion clause. Um, this is the first AP clause in both grasp and chaff. Then there is an option of learning other clauses. So, so in grasp, there is a learn clause for every other UAP of the conflict um, decision level. And then there is the backtracking step in which you can backtrack to any level between delta minus one, where delta is the current conflict level. And beta, which is the the level of no, of uh, non chronological backtracking, you can backtrack to any level there. So in grasp, it's all, always delta minus one, which is chronological backtracking in today's terminology, and in chaff, it's always beta, which is non chronological backtracking in today's terminology. And then you flip uh, C1 and just run BCP. Okay, so that that's an up to date algorithm for uh, conflict analysis, and. Uh, Let's go over the uh, evolvement of algorithms for conflict analysis. So there is the algorithm by Chaff, by Grasp, sorry, then by Chaff, and then the algorithm introduced in Chaff, so first AP close and non chronological backtracking was the state of the art until uh, 2018, where uh, we implemented chronological backtracking in uh, a version of the Maple Satso. And then uh, what we implemented there was a backtracking heuristic, which chooses between chronological and non-chronological backtracking. And then it was adopted by uh, other Maple-based solvers and crypto set and also Kisat. So the same heuristic, or maybe slightly different one, but the same idea is used by in Kisat 
for example. Now, the chronological backtracking algorithm is essentially similar to GRASPs, and I didn't realize it back then. So uh, I do, didn't realize that GRASP all, already implemented chronological backtracking. Uh, but the thing is that uh, it wasn't trivial at all to implement it because in GRASP, they used, uh, they watched all the literals. And it turned out that integrating chronological backtracking with two watch literal scheme is really a nightmare. So it's it's very complicated, and you must you, you might miss uh, you might miss bugs essentially. So uh, Norbert Matley uh, noticed that there was a bug, an infinite loop in our original implementation in, in Maple, which he fixed in merge set. And uh, so we introduced no no um, um, formal calculus, and so uh, you know it was kind of a messy messy stuff essentially. Um, and then in Cadical, Sibyl and Armin uh, used custom or score-based backtracking. The idea there is to backtrack to the decision level with the highest variable score. It's applied by Cadical, and we also I also adopted it uh, in, in Intelsat. But uh, in that paper, uh, also uh, chronological backtracking, uh, in the integration between chronological backtracking and BCP was implemented, but not really discussed. Okay, how you do, how you combine chronological backtracking with two watch literal scheme, essentially. So, I'm now going to talk now about integrating chronological backtracking BCP, why there is a problem there. Um, let me show you some examples of necessary adjustments. So assume we have this clause, okay? So the first two literals are unassigned, and then uh, the, there are two uh, falsified literals. And now with chronological backtracking, you might assign literals at lower levels than the current level. So this situation might actually happen that you have two first literals assigned at level one. That couldn't happen before. That couldn't happen in Chaff, for example. And uh, what you need uh, doing in this case is reordering the literals in the clause, which is not that difficult. You can do it. But that, that is an adjustment which is necessary for correctness, because otherwise you just might miss uh, uh, implications and even conflicts. If you don't do that, you might miss a conflict next time. Okay, so, but that's an adjustment which, which is done in the code, in the implementation. But uh, there are still some useful invariants which are violated even with the adjustments. So the first var uh, invariant is uh, what they call lowest implication. That in, in, invariant um, is satisfied in solos which implement non chronological backtracking, but not with chronological backtracking. So, no assigned literal can be applied at lower levels. So, such clause is impossible. Such situation is impossible in Chaff, for example, because this first literal would have been implied in this clause. And now it's implied at level 20 in another clause. Okay? So again, the first invariant, no uh, lowest implication, no assigned literal can be implied at, at a lower level. This is violated. And another one uh, is lowest conflict. So we have already discussed this. Uh, the invariant is, says that every conflict, BCP returns a clause falsified at the lowest possible level. So if there are possibilities, people would always turn this possibility. Hey, but this is now violated. So in, in solvers um, which implement chronological backtracking, you may find a conflict at any level. And what will happen then is that you, the conflict analysis loop will eventually get you to the lowest possible conflict. But you would need to learn many clauses uh, on the way, right? Many unnecessary clauses probably. And in Intel side, I ensure both invariants based on re-implication. So let me show you some more concrete examples of, of, of breaking of uh, these invariants broken, uh, starting with lowest implication. So um, let's assume we have a conflict, and this is the new conflict clause. And there are two other clauses which are currently satisfied. Okay? Now, when we unassign, so the, the highest assigned literal is L1. When we unassign L1, backtrack to chronologically to, to level 29, we have this situation. right? And then we flip L1. And after flipping L1, we have 
options for implying um, L2. Different pairing clauses depending on the indeterminate BCP order. So you might imply, we may imply L2 here in this clause, which guarantees lowest implication, but we might imply it in the second clause. Now, uh, lowest implication is broken because clause three is a missed implication. And again, this is something which is happening in, in modern solvers. Okay, so this is an example of how lowest application is broken with uh, chronological backtracking. And the reason, uh, just as for L1, the reason that you got level 10 because mm -hmm. is that you, you did some bookkeeping for your learned clause and you realize that although I'm, you know, I'm propagating it at level 29, you know that the assertion level of this clause is, is 10 and therefore you label L1 by 10. Is sort, that sort of what's going on? The, the conflict occurred in the first clause. Yeah. And, it just happened to be that the literals, the two other remaining literals, which are not L1, were assigned at level 10. Yeah. And because of that, L, after flipping L1, L1 is flipped at level 10. Yeah, yeah. But you keep, you keep track of that because, I mean, yes. like the, the solver is still at level 29 because you already, you only backtrack yes. one step. But yes. like when you're propagating, you're looking at, like, you at know that. Locally in the clause, you're propagating at level 10, as it were. Yes, 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 yes. So uh, I'm looking at the clause. And uh, so the clause in, in, at which L1 is propagated is the highest um, the, the level, is the highest level of, of the other literals in the clause. So if, if the parent clause of L1, of L1 contains falsified literals at level 10, then L1 is implied at level 10. If it, if it contains literals, say, falsified literals, say, at levels uh, uh, 9, 8, and 7, it would be implied at level 9. Can I suggest another explanation? Maybe maybe Jakob misses that this situation might occur during conflict analysis. So you're at, at level 30, and you find this conflictless clause as a conflicting clause. And then you would actually need to um, you 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 would say and this only can happen in chronological, right? Yes. And then instead of learning a clause, you would realize, oh, I can use this clause just for propagation. That's what's shown here, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm asking about the bookkeeping. Like, how do I like in here? It's easy to see, right? But I mean, uh, but the, the solver would need to somehow know. To I'm, I'm the question is specifically how what information I need in my internal bookkeeping to understand that the correct propagation level of L1 is 10. I mean, we can see it so in this you, illustration, but how does the code know it? That's so you just you, you just go over all the literals in the clause where you want to imply the L1 and, and choose the highest decision level in that clause. And that is, so the highest decision level in the parent clause, in the clause where L1 is implied, determines its level. But that seems expensive, no? Do I need to scan the whole clause then? Well, it depends on your implementation. So, I mean, if you have, if you if you discover a unit clause, you would need to scan it, and uh, in, in any case, right? Because how would you know that the clause is unit? Okay, so you're saying that's a good point. So you're saying like, uh, yeah, okay, so it won't cost me extra to sort of just keep track of this, is what you're saying. No, it if won't. I do it properly, yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. However, you do, I mean, if you if you discover that the closest unit, you need to visit it. So visit all the literals, and then you can just uh, you have this information for free. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so this is lowest implication, and then uh, how chronological backtracking breaks the lowest conflict. There is an example. So we have here new conflict, and this is the new conflict clause, and this is the clause below. In this case, this is a binary clause with L1 assigned at 30 and another literal assigned at level 10. And there are some other bunch of clauses, right? So now we unassign L1 and flip it at level 10. Now, again, it's flipped at level 10 because uh, all the literals in a sparing clause, first clause here, uh, are assigned at level 10. And then there are, so there, are, there is a conflict now, right? Because um, there is a conflict on L2, on the values of L2, but there are two possibilities for a conflict. The first one here and the second one there. And, and the standard, so the, the, solver, the solver can might pick any possibility uh, and uh, learn any of these conflicts. So it might learn a conflict level 20 or at level 15. If it learns a conflict 
if it decides there is conflict level 20, it will carry out conflict analysis at level 20. Learn the clause and then go back to level 15 and, and discover there is a conflict and learn the clause there too. Right? But at Intel side, we always learn a lowest conflict. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to uh, provide some motivation for uh, introducing reimplication in the context of incrementality. And how you find this lowest level, this is something that you'll talk about later. I mean, or is this supposed to be yes. obvious? It's not supposed to be obvious. No, 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 absolutely not. So I'm going to talk about it later in the second part of the talk. Yeah. So in this part of the talk, I, I just, uh, I'd like to show to provide some motivation for implication, I will not introduce the algorithm itself, uh, and then I provide some results, and then we'll go to this. I mean, to, for, for the break and the second part. So, um, okay. So there is a new definition here. A clause is unisat if it has one literal satisfied, and the rest, the literals are falsified. A clause is a misflow implication if it is unisat. So one literal satisfied, the rest are falsified. And the satisfied literal is assigned harder than the rest in terms of its decision level. So again, it cannot happen with non chronological topic tracking, but it might happen with chronological. So this clause is called missed lower implication. Well, let us look at the satisfiable solver invocation trace. So we have a very simple formula here. And this is just the trace for invocation of a solver. We don't have any conflict, so we decided L1, not L2, and we propagate learn L3 and L4. Okay, and, this, and we have a model here. Okay. Now we, we are talking about the incremental subsolver. And now assume that now we have a new incremental query. And the clause E is added before that query. Now this clause happens to be a missed lower implication. So intuitively, it's satisfied literal L2 should have been implied in E, the new clause, right? Uh, but wasn't there, so we didn't know. And uh, so the idea behind the implication is to literally reimply miss lower implications without backtracking. So the algorithm would understand that the uh, total two must be implied should be implied as this close, and would reimply it, and then it would uh, fix all the other literals which whose level must be fixed. So, for example, in this case, it would change the level of L3 to 1 and the level of L4 to 1. Okay. Now, you, in this case, you could do it also by backtracking and um, propagating the satisfied literal, but this is not the case for the generic case, because in the generic case, backtracking might remove some decision levels which you wouldn't want to, to touch at all, right? And the implication, it doesn't do backtracking, it just changes the decision levels. Whenever necessary, so as to ensure lowest implication. So that's the idea. That's what we want to do. So again, it, this is helpful for this incremental lazy backtracking uh, in the incremental settings, but also for fixing those invariants which I have mentioned. Okay, so that's all I wanted to tell you in the first part about uh, BCP and the implication of CDCL. But can, can you, you do can you just reiterate on why you do the reimplication? Yeah, I want to ensure that the literals are, are implied at the lowest possible level. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. And then, then I can I can learn uh, conflict clauses at lower levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So I want just to push everything lower, and it kind of makes sense uh, intuitively because you want your solver to be local. And you see, if you have a parent clause, for example, which is in which you have uh, literals you assign higher than necessary, you will just then take these literals into new conflict clauses, so it propagates. So you really want to, to push everything as low as possible. That's the intuition. And when uh, you re-imply things, you things. would also like swap things higher up or like closer to the to, to a lower number on the trail also. Like or, or... it does not change. It does not change the assignment itself. It only no, changes no. the decision. The decision but level. The position, yeah. No, ah, the position. So the position. So like, would uh, in, you actually in, move it on the trail or no? Yeah. So the thing is that in Intel SAT, I implement the trail as a doubly linked list, not yes. as a stack. So yeah. I always insert a, a literal at the end of each decision level. So I don't need to touch it. In the standard stack based implementation, I would probably move it. 
because they, yeah. they are I, yeah but so but, but, I don't, but I, like conceptually like in my head if i think of of the tra trail like as, yes. a, as a as an ordered like a list of literals then it would sort of yes then it would actually shift to the right and and do you force like full uh, do you do complete re-implementation or you do it like gradually like complete re-implication so I, after complete. i completely yes so after that it uh, lowest implication is guaranteed okay and that's okay. not too expensive no it's actually quite cheap because you visit only the, the you, you only visit closer through through their watch lists and only very locally so it, it's not expensive in practice i mean it works yeah it's actually, for me, it's easier to think about the trail now as a, as a double link list. So I just insert that literal and forget about it. But otherwise, I, I need to think about shifting. Yeah, and it's difficult. It's just compli complicated. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, and and but I guess one reason to put it in an array would be that I guess like locality and things. But you you won't have like real pointers in some sense. Like you, no, no, I don't have. Yeah, like you do it in an array. Yes. Somehow. Yes. I have so, an array of 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 two pointers. But I mean, I have an array, and every literal has two pointers in that array, two entries. Each entry is a pointer, so it is still local. So the the memory. It uses um, one buffer, continuous buffer of memory. Mm -hmm. Yes. You just okay. switch, the, you know, the arrows. So, so Alex, you said the, the assignment will not change, and but you will also not get a conflict, right? By re-implication or will, could you get a conflict in addition? No. No. Is this in no, the right? brain? You proved this somehow, or is it like clear that this is? Yeah, I, yes. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I show in the paper, so re-implication, uh, by construction, it does not change the assignment. So uh, if a variable was assigned true, it is still assigned true. If it was assigned false, it's still assigned false. If it was unassigned, it is still unassigned. It does not change it. And thus, you know, it cannot discover a new conflict. It just, it just pushes everything lower. I mean, like, you see, without these fixes, right, you don't have this invariant. It might well be that you have kind of a conflict somewhere hidden down somewhere in the decision level. And now by 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 reimplication, you kind of uh, get sort of a stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re, re, if there is a conflict, reimplication might move it lower. And actually, another thing which might happen is that uh, you some decision level might, decision levels might collapse. So you have a decision variable A at level twenty, which would now be implied at level eighteen, and so the the whole decision level twenty would disappear. That's something which is happening too. Okay. Yeah, so here I'm. So this is a slide about heuristics. So it's, it's uh, orthogonal to discussion before. I don't know. Maybe I should skip it, and we will should just concentrate on that. Uh, you know, CDC mm, no, stuff. No. I no? think there's time. I mean, there is time. Fine. Okay. So okay. So here is a summary of uh, new heuristics in uh, Intel SAT. So the first one I call it query-driven tuning. So the idea there is to tune heuristic differently based on the SAT query type. So in Intelsat, there are three queries, or uh, by queries, you know, incremental invocations or not incremental invocation of the solver. So there is the initial invocation, initial query. Then there is a normal incremental invocation and incremental invocation with conflict thresholds. So you, you know, short invocations. And what I found is that it makes, well, it makes a difference to tune the heuristics based on the SAT query type. Okay, so uh, I don't think uh, it, some some other, other solvers do it. Um, so I just found that if you play with the heuristic and tune, tune them differently, then it you know it works better. So I will give some examples in the second part of the talk. The other thing is I call it subsumption based flip close filtering. So flip recording is a, a, an additional a, a technique in which we record an additional conflict close. Actually. Uh, I had a paper about that technique in 2007, I think, but and then another paper, uh, 2019. And, uh, so the idea there is to record a close 
a first VOP close with respect to a decision level, a would be decision level of the latest flip literal. So, but just another hopefully close, but the observation here, so it, it didn't make it, this technique did not make it to, uh, to the state of the art uh, solvers. But what I found is that it is essential to check whether you can, whether this new close is subsumed by the standard first VOP close. So if you don't check it, you just clutter your class database database with already subsumed clauses. But if you do it, the whole the, the whole thing works well. Okay, so um, I think that it might also work for, for mainstream such so, so, although I didn't try it. But uh, you know, I made this observation. I think it, it is important. But it's in, in the context of um, so I tested into such uh, inside the Maxat solver, not not on on such competition benchmarks. But this is something which could fit there too, right? So this is idea number two, which I wanted to highlight. And then the third one is um, EVS IDS decision heuristic, which is the standard heuristic used by many solvers with incremental score reboot. So the idea there is at the start of a non normal incremental query. So one type of, 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 of the queries. In the beginning, the EVS IDS scores are increased more aggressively, right? And it simulates a score reboot. So uh, in the second part of the Part of the talk, I will show you how it is done in practice. So it's actually very simple to implement. Could, could you just explain, sorry, what, what does this mean? Like what, what are, when you say, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I didn't understand what the, this final point about how you change these. It's, if, could you so elaborate? It, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, sure. So what it means is that uh, I, I give more weight. So in, at the beginning of in normal incremental phases, normal incremental queries, I give more weight to the recent conflicts at the beginning of such queries. So I kind of um, reset the case idea scores. So okay, for example, you... like, like if you could take to the extreme, I, I would just uh, set all the scores to zero and just you know uh, start from the, restart from the beginning. That's what not I do, but not, not what I'm doing, but that's the idea. So you kind of reset the scores at the beginning of these queries. Not that aggressively, so I, I don't don't just put zeros there, but uh, that's the idea. So you like, I guess you like you could either sort of make the exponential decay faster, or you can bump it by yes. larger amounts, or this is all yeah. the same in the end. Or like yeah, yeah, I make like... it the yeah, yeah, yeah. I make it faster at the beginning by by changing some of the constants. And what's your intuition there? Is it that? The different queries that the same variables are not as relevant, or uh, yeah. So I think it might be actually application uh, dependent. So a, a normal incremental query, I I know that there there is no conflict limit, and there is time to explore, and probably there were some new conflict, new new clauses added by the user, and so I want to give them some um, so to make them play these new clauses and normally when there are um, this uh, fast rapid inc incremental queries with a, a small conflict threshold then probably there were no some new clauses and and uh, you know the user is just trying to, to to find a better solution or something but that's the intuition in the context of, of maxed of uh, any time maxed but would you still keep the learned clauses from one call to another yeah yeah everything else is kept this is just giving more weight to, to the recent data at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then it's exponential, so it will kind of recover. Okay. okay, so these are the three heuristics I wanted to highlight here. And this is my application in the paper. The application is unweighted maxed. So in unweighted maxed, we have a, on the input, we have a set of hard clauses, which, which are satisfiable. So this closes hold. This is one formulation of max. There are some others. But this is the most convenient one uh, in this context. And then there is the I call it an optimization target, a bit vector. For each target bit, i is a literal, and uh, the output of a max solver is a model m to the hard closes, which minimizes the number of satisfied target bits. Okay? So that's the idea. So this is SAT with a linear optimization. And this is unweighted. So there are no weights associated with these uh, target bits. And that's the application in the paper. So for example, if we have this uh, formula H, 
uh, and then the optimization target consisting of two bits A and B. There are only three models to H, M1, M2, and M3. And the first models are better than the third one. And that is because their weight is one. One target bit is satisfied out of A and B, right? Out of the, the two target bits, one is satisfied. And so the weight of these models is one and the weight is of M3 is two. So that's the problem. And uh, I implemented, so I, or rather, I, I um, inserted into SAT into an anytime access solver. And now, an anytime algorithm is an algorithm which is expected to find better and better solutions the longer it keeps running. And anytime access solvers are not guaranteed to return an optimal solution, although some tools do. It improves the solutions frequently, and uh, it's been a long time since it started to be evaluated in access evaluations. And uh, I'm interested in any time access and any time optimization because I found that in my industrial uses, that is what is essential. Because um, I cannot allow my tool to get stuck, right? I have an industrial tool and returning some solution and non-optimal solutions way better. So uh, for the experimental results, I integrated into SATs into the MaxSat Solver TT Open WBO Inc. and tested it on unweighted incomplete categories. Incomplete means any time. And I, I also used uh, SAT like C solvers um, and it's two versions of TT Open WBO Inc. with glucose and Intel SAT solver. Uh, but all the solvers are conceptually similar. So they all use both SAT like C and TT Open WBO Inc. use SAT like, which is local search, and then TT Open WBO Inc., which is a SAT based anytime access algorithm. So, uh, so they differ only in heuristics internally. And I also tested for various uh, configurations of um, PT Open WBO Inc. with Intel SAT to test the impact of, of these heuristics. And so here is the table with the results. Uh, now, I, I ran these solvers over, uh, this is in MaxSat evaluation 2021. This is the time also, it goes from one minute uh, to five minutes. And these are the scores. So you can see that TT21i, so it's TT open WBO int with Intel SAT, is normally much better than the other solvers, including TT21g, which is the same solver with glucose. Uh, so here, some exceptions, but the time loads um, are low here, and thus local search um, makes impact here. And But then with the time, as the time goes by, uh, the impact of Intel SAT is higher. Okay, and uh, in the paper and also during the next hour, I will show that each of the new introduced heuristics is actually significant. Okay, so I think, yeah, I'm done with the first part. I'm thinking we can take, uh, we already had a few questions, but maybe if there are any, like I certainly, like one curious, so, so a few questions and then we'll have a break. Is there anything particular with unweighted? I mean, if you, is there any yeah. reason not to plug it into a weighted max that solver and see what happens? Yeah, actually, I plugged it, plug, plugged it into the weighted solver too, but the in unweighted solver, the queries are lighter. And so the impact is higher, although in the MaxSet evaluation, actually, I got better results for, for weighted instances, instances too. But in the paper, I just decided to concentrate on unweighted MaxSet. Okay. So it works better. And so these techniques work work well when you have, uh, you know, light satisfied queries. And uh, in unweighted MaxSet, there are more such queries. Other questions from the yeah. audience? I mean, the, 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 the most um, like difficult to, um, uh, uh, to do things like to port to say my solvers would of course be this um, uh, lower level propagation, right? And I, I would be really curious, like um, how often this really helps, right? And, and like sort of more some detailed statistic, like how often really triggers and, and maybe you see, I actually don't know, like, what would be a good way to evaluate this? Like, what would be the the metric you want to see, which tells you, okay, so because of this lower level propagation, I get something better. And what would better be? Do you have any ideas how to do that? Like, like how do you measure? Yeah. That? Well, except for just implementing it, I don't really know. And even if I provided you some statistics, I'm not sure that it would uh, it would be representful for you because I I my solver is implied in, in totally different flows. It's used in you know this. Anytime max it and also in optimization flows with a huge number of SAT queries. So I think that the boost, the best way to check that would be just to implement and see. 
although it would take time, of course, and effort. Yeah, but but I, I'm, so this is really my question, sort of like like really looking sort of top down at these numbers you have is a little bit unsatisfactory to me because I would want to see sort of it would be nice to have a metric which would really tell you, okay, because you introduce these lower level implications and then later you, you're probably going to talk about this watch list, uh, this uh, uh -huh. blocking interest too, like, like what, what would it really give you, right? And just sort of looking at sort of by the scores of the Maxat competition evaluation is kind of, you see, I don't really see like, like how much do you really gain, right? Or is it, you see, it could be, it could also be something, so it, it so it, it does a flavor of sort of implicit restarts or some things. And then you might be able to achieve the same thing by a different restart strategy, you see? So what I'm saying? So, so sort of you have something, you have, you, you have an idea, you implement it, and, and, and it, it will have the effect, but you're only measuring it sort of at, 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 sort of at the very other end. Yes. It's unclear sort of whether you just sort of, the fix you're showing is just producing some other effect, which at the end produces that. So that's why, why I was thinking maybe there's a way, um, I, I, I don't know, right? Like otherwise, do, do you have a metric in mind? I mean, some concrete. No, this is exactly, I, mean, yeah. I was thinking about sort of propagation times, so the integral over the propagation of the levels or something. But you see, I don't well, know. That's maybe I'm asking this question. Yeah, right? maybe maybe in Kisset you could just measure the number of times when you have a conflict at a higher level. So there will be times where you have several conflicts. This is something you can measure. You can maybe just take your time and discover, find all the conflicts, and then see how many times you have conflicts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At lower levels. Uh, yeah, exactly. That, that's but, something but, you could do. But you know this, uh, like this phase switching in in our solvers, right? So in this this case where you don't restart the decision, like the conflict level, average conflict level is actually way higher than than for the phases where you restart very often. And so, so the the metric, you the obvious metric for your method would be to measure the average conflict level, right? Yeah. But this, but, this of course, like you just increase the, the restart interval by 10% in big shift, right? So this is no, why but, this is not a good one. So that's why I'm saying... No, no, no. What I'm saying is, is, is different. So uh, when you have a conflict in key set, instead of stopping, just go ahead and, and uh, try to find other conflicts and see how many times you actually have conflicts at lower levels, just for the sake of statistics. You know, don't do it in the production version. Just for the sake of statistics, see how many conflicts you could you could you missed. Um, okay you missed yes for example, or or how many uh, missed low replications you have every time, right? If you don't have missed low replications at all, for example, then of course you know it wouldn't help. Or if you don't, of of you if you have you know one uh, conflict out of a million when there is a lower conflict, then also there will be no impact. Uh, but if you know if you have like you know, twenty percent of the conflicts uh, have a lower version, then probably you will have it. Yeah, that's probably what I would do. Okay, lots of lots of interesting questions. I'm thinking, uh, in the interest of time, maybe we uh, take a short break now. Okay. So we're back after the break, and uh, we'll have uh, Alex Nadal continue, please. Okay. So let's see. Yeah, let's now talk about invariance for the watches in current BCP implementations before talking about uh, re-implication and other Intel SAT specific stuff. So BCP and backtracking in, in current solvers maintain the following invariants. Okay, so each of the two, two watches, CI uh, in the close, so the first two liters in the close are watches C1 and C2, are either. So each one is either non-falsified, that is satisfied or unassigned. Okay, so this is option number one. If a watch is satisfied or unsigned, we are fine. We cannot just, you know, the, the clause cannot be unit, nor can it be a, conflict, a, a falsified clause. Another option, which is still fine, if the cash literal of that watch is satisfied, then when BCP visits um, this clause, it just goes goes on, right? It, it uh, does not need to, to visit other literals in the clause. And then there is another option. If the, that watch, for example, C1 is falsified, then, the non-watch leaders must be all falsified, and at the decision level, 
which is not lower than the decision level of, uh, of the watch. This is to ensure that after backtracking, um, the literal, the watches become unassigned, right? So let me show you some examples. I assume we have this close, this fine or not. So the first literal here is satisfied. The second one is unassigned. So this is fine, right? Really soon. Then uh, let's consider this close. The first watch is satisfied, which is fine. The second watch is falsified, but um, it, it, it's cached literal is a satisfied literal, so we are fine too. Now, we have this close. This is what they call missed lower implication. Now, so if you look at, at this close and, and think about uh, you know, how such solvers work, you may think that breaking, that backtracking to decision level 45, for example, decision level between 40 and 50, might actually break, break the invariant, right? Because, um, you know, nothing guarantees that we would visit this clause and and uh, and uh, discard that this is a unit clause. And essentially, it would break the invariant, uh, but it doesn't because of uh, special handling of out of order literals carried out by, by solar simply medical chronological backtracking. So, an out of order literal uh, is a literal in the trail which is assigned lower than the current level, right? So, uh, okay, so now once the unassigned C2, this outer order literal handler will ensure to reassign C2, re-invoke BCP, revisit disclose C, then re-imply C1 in C if necessary. Okay, and this is actually essential for correctness. So again, this close, this uh, the second literal here, it must be out of order literal. Uh, and then it would be re-implied, and then uh, we would get to this close, and, and thus we do not miss it, right? So for example, Kisset wouldn't miss this close. Uh, but you know, for us, it's, it's a missed lower implication. And uh, uh, so again, in Kisset, for example, this situation is okay. So BCP would just say, okay, we have a satisfied close and you know, go on. And Intelsat will have a special handling of, of such close. Then this close, it's fine. The first uh, literal is satisfied, and the uh, second one is falsified, but it's higher than the other literals in the close, than the watch literals. And this close finally is not good because second watch falsified, but it's lower than, uh, than, than the third literal, and thus after backtracking, there will be a problem. The invariance will be broken. So these are invariants in the current close. Now, in the paper, I have a formal framework. Uh, which proves the correctness of BCP. So there are some uh, uh, frameworks which prove the correctness of CDCL, but they all implicitly assume that BCP never misses falsified clauses for correctness and never uh, misses unit clauses for performance. And now it's really not self-evident. And for example, no one ever proved that out of order literal handling was correct. So in the paper, there is a formal framework to argue that our BCP terminates, does not miss falsified and unit clauses and guarantees lowest implication, lowest conflict. So I will not go over the whole thing here, but uh, then we'll get uh, to like, the ma main concepts in that framework. So, uh, this is a, a, the summary of changes of BCP in Intelsat as compared to standard BCP implementation. So the first change is then whenever there is a missed law replication, whenever a missed law replication is encountered by BCP, the solver invokes re-implication to re-imply it, okay? So this is not, um, not a, I mean, this, the clause is not skipped, right? Rather than the implication is, 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 uh, is used. I will cover it uh, later, how it works. And there are no out of order literals at all because the trail is always ordered by decision level using a doubly linked list. Okay, so this is lower implication handling. Then there is conflict management. So uh, BCP in Intelsat does not stop at the first conflict. Uh, it just stored falsified, stores falsified clauses, and it makes sure that the uh, falsified clauses are always contradicted, meaning that the two literals, there are two literals falsified at the current level. There are some exceptions. I will show later how they're handled. At the end, a BCP will return a contradicting clause, a clause with, which, with two literals falsified at the current level. Uh, this is necessary for, for the correctness of, of uh, 
Total CDL algorithm, so complex analysis. And again, in the paper, there is a pseudo code and correctness proof. Now I am introducing the notion of stable closes. The very important. Do you, want, do you want to say why you want more than one conflict, or, or you'll explain this later? Yeah, yeah, because I want um, I want to eventually to discover the lowest possible conflict. Ah, and for so that I need to yeah. So you like somehow you're going to when you know you're at the conflict level, you're going to somehow keep propagating and. Yes. you don't see anything more or yes i will keep propagating until there are no conflicts and uh, know that the re-implication might actually change uh, this levels of, of of literal so i might record the conflict close and at that point it would be at level you know 40 but then suddenly it will become the lowest conflict because the implication will will lower the decision levels of, of the literacy that close and you know such things happen Okay. So I just keep all the conflict clauses, and then at the end, I just make sure that uh, I, I pick the lowest one. Also, uh, like um, on the fly, if if um, okay, I talk about it later. But in the end, there will be uh, you know, the lowest conflict. Okay, so um, now there is this concept of table clauses, which I will go over, and then we will get to the implication. So the goal here is to disallow missed lower implications in Intelsat. So in a standard uh, CB, chronological backtracking enabled solver, this situation is fine. In Intelsat, we don't want such clauses to exist after BCP. So here I introduce the notion of a stable clause. So a closed C is PI stable for the two watches. So C1 stable or C2 stable. Uh, if, for example, C1 is either non-falsified, satisfied or unassigned, which is fine, then, then the watch is fine, of course. And the other option is that the cached literal is satisfied, but the decision level of that cached literal cannot be higher than the decision level of the watch. So this is disallowed, essentially. And we want, um, okay, so the clause is stable if it's both C1 and C2 stable. And Intelsat guarantees that if BCP finishes without a conflict, all the clauses are stable. So there will be no lowest uh, uh, missed lower implications uh, after BCP. Now, in order to implement BCP uh, and, and the implication, we need uh, three intermediate exceptions for, from, for a clause from being stable. So they're intermediate because they occur only during BCP uh, and then you know, we fix them all. So there's uh, three options for unstable clauses. First, the first exception is for clauses which are watched by falsified literals, because BCP will make them stable again. So there is a stack of, of literals to be propagated by BCP. And a clause C is called CI BCP registered, if not CI part of that stack. So essentially, when a watch CI is assigned zero, we request not CI to be added to the BCP stack pi, and then that watch is safe. Although it is falsified, okay. So the, the watch is safe; it's stable when it's uh, satisfied or unassigned. But it's also safe when it's when BCP is going to visit that close through that watch, because BCP will fix everything. So the a clo a close C CI BCP safe if it's either CI stable or CI BCP registered, and CI is BCP safe if it is both uh, both C one BCP safe and C two BCP safe. So we light BCP safe close. And after know, know that after BCP, there will be no BCP register clauses anymore. And so any BCP safe clause uh, is stable, a stable clause. This is exception number one. Yeah. So, so the question, when you say stack, it could be a set, right? It doesn't really matter, it, right? Yes, it could be anything. Yes. Yeah. It could be a set. But does stability already guarantee that you're finding all conflicts at the right level? Um, yeah, that's a good no. No, it guarantees it guarantees there are no missed lower implications, but then there is another procedure in BCP, uh, which uh, so it guarantees that I find the, all the conflicts. At so I, if I have many conflicts, all of them will be at the lowest possible level for like that conflict. But then I will need to pick a conflict still. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is a special procedure in BCP for handling falsified clauses. 
stability guarantees that um, there are no missed or implications after BCP. If BCP finishes correctly, like without a conflict. Oh, but you're saying like if you actually, okay, but you might have missed implications, but the guys you've seen are at least at the right level. But you're not guaranteeing oh, no, after, no. A few, after a few chronological backtracks, uh, like in there, might there be proper, no. No, 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 no. It's always, there are no missed over implications after BCP. And there are no missed propagations? At when when I like when you propagated at the level, will there be any clause in the database that could potentially have propagated but has not yet propagated? No, no. It's like in the standard BCP. Like one, one BCP, let's say that BCP assume that BCP finished without a conflict, then all the clauses have been propagated, right? That's the point in BCP. Otherwise, there would be missed uh, implications. So that's how the standard BCP works. Implications are not missed. But here we also guarantee that after BCP, there are no missed or implications, meaning that this, you know, clauses where one literal satisfied higher than all the other falsified literals, they cannot exist. So every literal is implied um, in the lowest at the lowest possible level. Okay. okay. We'll see later how re-implication works. Maybe uh, some things will be clear then. But here I just explained the exceptions. Uh, just to give you an idea, you know, what, what kind of exceptions you need to implement BCP. Also, we won't, won't go over BCP itself. Okay, so the clauses are stable unless uh, they are, they are uh, fall into the three exception, exception categories. So this is the fourth exception category. The second exception is for re-implication. So there are clauses we put uh, on the set, stack uh, lambda r. These clauses are clauses to be visited by re-implication. And these clauses, we allow them to be missed lower implications. But there's a list of additional conditions here. So a clause C is re-implication registered if all these conditions hold. So it belongs to that uh, set. Then the clause is also unisat, so there is one satisfied literal, the rest are falsified. The satisfied literal is the first one in the clause. The cached literal of the second watch points to that satisfied literal, and the decision levels of the uh, decision level of the second watch is not lower than the decision level of the other literals. Let me show you an example to make it clearer. So, for example, this clause. Let's see if it's uh, okay or not. Uh, so assume it belongs to that set. This unisat, one literal is satisfied and the rest are falsified. C1 is satisfied here. Cash literal of uh, of this, the second of C2 is to C1, which is fine. But the last condition does not, is not satisfied, does not hold. Oh, not good. But this missed law replication is fine. So this close is the implication registered. And so is this clause. So this clause is actually stable, but it might uh, uh, happen that a re-implication will, will visit this clause. And uh, whenever the clause is inserted into this set, uh, lambda r, is a missed lower implication. During the implication, it might have been turned into a stable clause accidentally. So we want to allow such clauses. And so there is a question here, why do we need these additional constraints? And uh, the reason is that we want a re-implication register clause to be either BCP safe, uh, like this one, the third one here, or to be the, to be a missed lower implication, which re-implication can fix. So it will be fixed by re-implying here C1 and C. So uh, the first letter and the second clause will be re-implied that clause. And after the fix, the clause will become stable. Does BCP safe? Okay, so this is the second exception. So the first exception was for um, watches or clauses which are going to be visited by BCP. This is an exception for clauses to be visited by reimplication. And the uh, third and final exception is for falsified clauses. So we store falsified clauses in a set uh, lambda f, and the clause sees falsification registered uh, if it belongs to that set and is falsified. So these are the, uh, the three exceptions which allow allow us to run BCP, uh, including uh, 
reimplication and also handle falsified clothes. So now this is a summary of, of um, both states in Intelsat. Stable is the desired state. So is each watch is non-falsified or it has a, a satisfied cash literal at not a higher level. Then the closest BCP safe if it's um, a, a stable or BCP registered. Okay, so here's the definition of what BCP register is. So essentially, BCP register means that the clause will be visited by BCP. And there is a, a set of uh, reimplication registered clauses and falsification registered clauses. Now we are going to talk about reimplication. So here is a summary of what it does. What it does is fixing, by fixing, I mean making stable any missed lower implications until fixed point. So every unstable reimplication register clause R. So uh, uh, it's going to be fixed and its watch list is going to be handled. So we are going to visit every clause in, uh, in that uh, set and fix every clause. And then when you fix a clause, then other clauses might be affected, but those clauses must belong to the watch list of net not R1. And so we are going to, to visit the watch list and, and fix this clause only there. Now, a replication never changes the current assignment. It never increases the levels of any of the assigned literals, but it may decrease the levels of the assigned literals, and it might also cause some levels to collapse and disappear if their decision literals re implied at a lower level. But this is a summary. Now we are going to look into the function itself. And this is the function re implied. It starts. So Question yes. just about this hashed literal for watches, which I was unfamiliar with. Is it important yeah. to understand? Like, I mean, if I if I'm pointing to a, a literal at a higher level that is satisfied, is there any reason why I wouldn't have like just swapped this literal and the watch? Like, or what what are these hashes and what are they used for? Or is ah, this like irrelevant yeah. in this context? So, uh, okay, so um, originally the, this uh, hash literals were introduced in order to, uh, to speed things up. So you have a watch list, and then um, the idea was to keep another literal from uh, every close pointed by, by, by the watch list, to keep another literal, and, uh, and then if that literal is satisfied, you don't need to visit the close. So this is uh, good for efficiency. So in the watch list, so say you have a literal L, there is a, the watch list of L and there are closes there, which you want to visit. And then uh, there is also, in addition to, to the close, there is also another literal from that close. And if that literal happens to be satisfied, you don't need to visit the close. So you save close visit and uh, you save, save potential cash misses. This is actually very efficient in practice. But you know, this is in standard solvers. But here, uh, uh, so in this framework, I also want to force the cash literals, any satisfied cash literals to be assigned not higher than the watch to prevent miss lower implications. So in my framework, I take like I take advantage of, of this cache literals for, for for correctness, not only for speeding up stuff. So maybe because I know okay, it, it, thanks. okay. Okay, so that's the idea. Yeah, but I think the, the original authors called it blocking literal, which is of course a misnomer, but they called it like that. Yeah, so blocking I, literal. Yeah, though I call it also blocking literal actually. Right. And the reason this is not the watch is that like typically this is something I would discover. Do... No, wait. I mean, if I discover it during unit propagation, then I guess it would be one of the watches. Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I'll read up on it maybe offline. Uh, just, it was a new concept for me. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, it can be any literal in the close essentially. But if you discover it uh, during during propagation, you may point like you may point to any literal you visit. You, you may choose it. Yeah, maybe it, it you know if you implement something like that in in pseudo so that could be used. But yeah, it's oh, but it could be that I could discover it when I'm updating a watch and I'm scanning the clause and I discover that oh, this yes. clause is actually satisfied. At that point, yes. I would like save the hash somewhere and not worry about the watches. Something like this. Yes, yes. Save it in the watch list, like in the watch list itself. That's where it is saved. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So here is the function reimply. So what it does, it goes over this uh, set of, of um, closes in lambda r. Then it fetches every close, and that close, uh, if it's if you miss slow replication, it, then it's fixed. Now there are two invariants. So every close which belongs, which is in the system, not in that uh, in that set, is either BCP safe or falsification registered. Okay, so this is in in an invariant which is maintained at the beginning of frame five, also at the end of frame five, of course, and uh, at every iteration. And every close which belongs to uh, lambda r is reimplication registered. By the end, the, the algorithm guarantees by construction that lambda r is empty, because all the closes are either BCP safe or falsification registered, which is great. That's what we want to achieve. So, right? So BCP safe means that uh, it's either stable, already stable, or going to be visited by BCP, which will make it stable, or falsification registered, meaning that it's falsified and then it will, it's going to be handled by BCP as part of uh, falsified close management. Okay, so now let's see what, what reimply does. So um, it fetches a close. If it's already BCP safe, then it just continues. Uh, otherwise, it's a lower implication by construction because it's a reimplication registered. What we do is reassign R1, the first literal of the close, uh, with the parent close R in that close at the decision level of R2. And uh, remember that R2 is guaranteed to have the highest uh, decision level because of uh, how we construct that uh, that's the set, because how we define the replication register close essentially. Okay, so we fix R to make it BCP safe, but what it might do is, what it actually does, it changes the decision level of R1, and that might render some of the closes in the watch list of not R1, not BCP safe. So we would want to visit these clothes and fix them. It might happen if not R1 becomes lower than it's cached literal in the watch list. Okay. So let's see. We'll have an example later, a great example too. Now, if not R1, if R1 is already BCP registered, uh, then we continue because the close is going to be visited by BCP and it will fix stuff. Otherwise, we really need to go over the watch list of not R1. By the end of the iteration, C will be either BCP safe or replication registered or falsification registered. If C is already replication registered or falsification registered, then we continue because uh, it will be visited by either our loop or handled by BCP later. If the cached literal is satisfied at the decision level not higher than the date of R1, we don't need to, to, to visit that close because it's already stable. Okay, so again, we don't need to do anything here. And the rest of the lines here make C either, either stable or the application registered. And I'll show how these lines work on an example. Okay, so we have a close R here. Okay, this is a mislower implication consisting of two literals, a binary close. And um, I will show how the close C, another close, this close looks like after uh, every line in in the, in the corresponding line in the algorithm is complete. So essentially, you see R1 is going now, is going to be reimplied at 11.20, and this clause will change. Let's see how it changes. This clause belongs to the watch list of not R1. Okay, so uh, at this point, you know, you can see the clause. Now, after R1 is unassigned, then the clause looks like this. So R1 is assigned level 20. And this close is a mislower implication, right? We can see it. So we need to reorder things inside the close to, to make it re-implication register. So that's the idea. And so to get this point, so this point, what it does, it uh, makes sure that the satisfied literal becomes the first watch. So we, we just swap two watches. And then, these two lines, what they do is making sure that the second watch is either uh, satisfied or unassigned, or if it is falsified, then it is the highest possible falsified literal. So we just reorder literals in the close. And now you see the first literal is satisfied, higher than the other literals. And then we have the, the highest possible falsified literal. 
So this clause is a, a missed lower implication, right? It could have been stable too, but this particular clause is a missed lower implication. And so what we do, we just push it to delta R. Okay, and it will be visited later by the same function. Okay, so that's, that is how our implication works. So if you have any questions, that's the time to ask them. Okay, so the algorithm tries not to visit the watch list uh, if possible. And, um, but it should be more, more uh, you know, quite cheap in practice because it visits uh, close only when required. All right. Okay, so that was the implication. Uh, yeah, so okay. I guess uh, one question is for like, is this what, the difference between theory and practice? I'm thinking in theory, if I could cook up an evil example where like things get re-implied, you know, 10 times at lower levels then this sort of goes, I clearly it terminates, right? But I, yeah. like if, if I yeah. visit a clause over and over and over again, probably I yeah. could, like maybe I can cook up such an example, but what you're saying is that, you know, it, that this works in practice is what you're saying. Or do you like say, no, no, uh, no actually, uh, I visit no, a clause only once or like- Yeah, that's a, very good, that's a very good point. I don't show it here, but I uh, essentially uh, I do check for a literal. If I get to a literal uh, in practice, there is an additional. So I check that I don't uh, visit a clause over and over again. If I visit a clause, then, uh, I implied the reader at the lowest possible level there. So there, so it's not shown here, but that's a good point. I think I, I talk about it in the paper. Yeah, but the point, yeah. I, I guess what I'm worried about is like, after, you know, now I do something else in a while, clearly you fixed like R1, I guess, mm -hmm. but but like maybe later the the other guy, the, the the body of of r1 gets re-implied at the you know level 15 and now you need to fix r1 again yeah the thing is that i think what i'm doing i i remember that i thought about it and i think i said i have some kind of over fix to this algorithm and uh, that you know i forgot what exactly i'm doing here but somehow you can handle this situation when you are visiting the watch list of the clause so you, you uh, and a close, no, wait a minute. So I think what they actually do that before adding a close to that, uh, to, to Lambda R, that stack, check whether there is another close in which the same literal is implied, is re-implied. And I add only the, the lowest possible close. That's what I'm doing, I think, yes. So there will, won't be a situation where there, there are several closes in which the same literal is re-implied. That won't happen because there is an explicit uh, check. I don't know if uh, that answers your question or not. It sounds like you're claiming that even some theoretical guarantees that this will be good. Right? Probably, yeah, well, but I don't have any. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't no, have no, a theoretical no. proof, yeah, but but uh, I do have some kind of, uh, of handling at least of some you know cases. Okay. Yeah. There is a theoretical proof that it will terminate it, essentially. There is a term, proof. Termination, I'm, I'm on, totally on board with termination. I'm just wondering if you can upper bound yeah. how many times I revisit yeah. the literal, which is not obvious to me. But you know, yeah, that's I mean. That's a good question, yes. I don't know, I mean, yeah. Yeah, there is that optimization which I told you about. Uh, other than that. Well, well, it looks to me you yeah. might want to use in for this Lambda R uh, priority queue somehow. And, and use uh, clauses maybe by the decision levels. So if you do a look, like lexicography comparison with respect to the decision levels in this literals in this clause. So you would need to keep them sorted with respect to decision level or so. Sorry, I, I was cut from internet. I, so can you please repeat, Armin? And no, I thought like maybe a priority queue would would which would the lambda doing a priority queue on lambda, which would uh, take the sorties 
you would sort the clauses in this priority queue by their decision level. And of course, you would first need to sort the literals within one clause by decision level. No, but the literals are already sorted by decision level. That, that's uh, how they are constructed. So uh, the reimplication register closes. I mean, because um, at least it is guaranteed that the watches are the highest titles. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't mean the whole, you know, discussion to get sidetracked. I was just curious. But any, anyway, I mean, it definitely works. And you're saying if we think a bit, we might even get, get some guarantees for this with a little bit of thinking. That's maybe, what I'm yes. Maybe. Okay. So, um, yeah, let me get to the next slide. Okay, so, um, yeah, this is about termination. So, it terminates because the um, type of the schedule is reduced, or uh, so each each iteration either reduces the size of the of, of uh, lambda r, or it, or it lowers the level of a literal. Then, uh, you know, eventually it will terminate. But yeah, I, I agree with you that it would be nice to think about some other guarantees. Yeah, but. Yeah, they are not in the paper, but probably yeah, something could be. I mean, I did not encounter situations where the goals are stuck in the implication. And also, I measured, uh, I did some measuring in uh, you know, lithium in performance profiler, and um, the implication was marginal. So the runtime of the implication was always marginal. So in practice, I didn't see any problems. Still, BCP uh, runs you know, the majority of the time. And the implication almost doesn't have an input. So in practice, in my application, applications around them. All right. So just a slide about falsified clause management in BCP. Just one slide. Uh, all right. So we maintain falsified clauses in a set lambda f. And, and then the clauses become falsification, falsification registered. Now, a falsification register clause can be either either of the three options. The first option is backslick contradicting, uh, which that means that the two, there are two highest literals which are assigned at the same level. But then uh, a backslick contradicting clause might be contradicting or not. There are contradicting clause is a backslick contradicting clause at the current decision level. Okay, so if you encounter a clause with um, two literals, for example, the first clause here, two literals assigned at level 20. If you are already at level 20, then it's a contradicting clause. If, you, if um, um, uh, it might not be the case, in which, in, in which case you want to backtrack, okay? To, to, to backtrack to the level, so you might be now higher than the, the highest level in the clause, uh, and then you, you may want to backtrack to, to, to that level. So, for example, if you are now at level uh, 25 and you counter this close, you just back it to level 20. Now, uh, another option is encountering a, a fake classification register close, which has only one literal assigned at the highest level. Um, so, okay, I explain a bit later on the same slide what I do in that case. So, essentially, uh, if there is a fake close, I just backtrack and flip inside BCP. Okay, so that's how they're handled, at least when the first falsified clause is discovered. So again, if I, if there is a backer contradicting clause, then it's made contradicting by backtracking to that level, to the highest level of the clause. And if there is a fake clause, then uh, algorithm backtracks and flips the, the highest literal. And then there is an algorithm to handle, uh, um, so if there are many falsified clauses, there is a dedicated algorithm to ensure that all the falsification register clauses are contradicting. Any reason you're setting it to level 29 here instead of 20? Because I want to be uh, like chronological. I back chronologically. I don't want to back it chronologically if. Uh... No, no, you can backtrack to but level that's... 29, yeah. but somehow the, 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 like the propagation level is off. No? Actually, you're, you're right, 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 right. You're right. It should be 20. Sorry. This is a typo on the slide. You're saying you're going backtracking yeah, yeah, yeah. 29, yeah. but it's labeled by 20. Yeah, it should be 20. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, management falsified clauses. 
And now we are going to heuristics. Now the question is uh, whether we have time or not. If you don't have time, um, I think it depends on the speaker. Uh, I'm happy to listen, and you know, people who are don't have time can just discreetly drop out. So it, it's really, I think, it's up to you how how you know how much time you have to entertain us. So I think that's me. I'm turning turning okay. the question back to you. Okay, I see. Okay, so let's let's complete the presentation. So there is not much material left. Okay, so um, let me first say which heuristics and algorithms are not used by Intelsat. Okay, so there is no differentiation between SAT and unsat stages because we expect most of the queries to be satisfiable. This is something standard, of course, this differentiation in, in uh, other solvers. There's no in processing and no verification because they are too heavy for these uh, rapid queries. Again, one may think about some versions of in processing which would not be that heavy, but uh, right now there is no in processing. Oh, and there's no rephasing. Uh, so Rephasing means like playing with the polarity, setting the polarity based on different algorithms. Because in Maxat and also in my placement application, there is a separate polarity selection heuristic and a high level heuristic, which knows about the optimization goals. And so uh, rephasing would just not uh, interfere with it. And I also implemented two techniques, uh, all trail, trail saving and all the P recording, but they just didn't improve the performance of Intelsat. So these heuristics are not in it also. So rephasing, we're way out of my comfort zone now, but would this be the kind of thing that Armin is doing? Like you have yes. several different phases that are somehow... Yes. Okay, yeah. nothing of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Armin is doing. Yes. Okay. And and you're saying, so since you're focusing on... I probably don't want to use Intelsat in a core-guided Maxat solver? Probably not, because there most of the queries would be answered. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But again, in my optimization flows, or most the vast majority of queries are SAT. Um, yeah. At least you know, uh, Intel SAT can be tuned. So I would experiment. If you have a good application, you know, one may, might experiment with you know there are uh, dozens of parameters, and uh, I think one could find a good configuration for fast unsatisfiable queries too. But uh, that's not what I did. So, so, so there's like uh, one interesting aspect is so like we the the reason why we do this rephasing is because we have these target phases, and mm -hmm. these target phases are particularly good for satisfiable instances. But if you only do this without rephasing, you get kind of hooked up, locked up in local minima. So it's kind of a reaction to adding target phases, with, with which in the first place are particularly geared for satisfiable instances. So that's why. Questions, of course, do you use target phases? So I don't use that. So the thing is that in, in optimization problems, the, the polarity heuristic, what it does is um, sticking with the latest, uh, the best, latest best solution. So in optimization, you have a score associated with every solution. And in practice, what works the best is just uh, fixing the polarities to the latest best solution, except for the target bits, which are set to the optimal solution. So uh, you can, if you want to go to go near uh, the latest best solution, but in the same time also to be like near the, the optimal solution, but then it, that would interfere with target phases. Uh, which is which is almost the same in a certain sense, right? Like um, yes, it, it's yeah, but in SAT there is no no uh, no cost, right? To, well, the optimum is the height of the trail, right? And then now you're saying you have some outside optimal function. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. I have already have. An optimum from previous invocations, okay. like the, the best. Okay, so maybe it's yeah, it's thinner. But how how do I know? I mean that. The, so so you're saying basically that the 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 objective function I always want to minimize. That's the so mm -hmm. no phase saving. I always minimize the objective, and for non-objective variables, the incumbent wins, like the best so yes. far. Yeah. And how so do, the, how does the solver know this? This is somehow you tell it that listen, this no, is. The, the, Phase no, that, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good question. So there is phase saving in the first invocation of the solver. So the phase saving is implemented. That's not rephasing, right? Phase saving, just reusing the, the, the latest uh, phase of every variable that is implemented. But in practice, in Maxit, it is used only for the first iteration 
and on for, for uh, variables which are not part of the target. And then they are overridden by, uh, by forced polarities. So there is an API to Intelsat, which allows the user to force polarities of certain variables. I think that Kadihal also has it, Armin. Uh, yes. Yeah, right. So uh, then you can use that API to override uh, the polarities of, uh, of variables. And so in practice, in Maxet, the polarities are all, all the variables are overridden. But if you don't override them, then uh, Intelsat will just use the phase saving. But no target phases. So no rephasing or no local search either. OK, thanks. Yeah, because if you have many uh, satisfiable queries, then uh, you know you ju don't just want to find one; you want to find you know one after the others. That's that the idea. All right. So um, that was heuristics, algorithms not, which are not used. Now, que uh, query-driven tuning, which I've already mentioned. So um, I think that's. I've already mentioned that. So um, switching the heuristics on the fly can be crucial. We all know. For example, there are separate site and such stages in modern solvers. And the starting criterion uh, is switching after X conflicts or propagations or, or restarts. But the idea in query-driven tuning is switching based on the SAC query type. Right? So in, in our application, it's either the initial query, non-incremental one, a short incremental query with the conflict threshold of 1,000, uh, very frequent. Right or normal normal incremental queries and unlimited incremental queries. Sorry, could you just allow a short incremental with the conflict threshold? Yes. What does it mean? So it means that that no matter what, once you have reached a conflict threshold of one thousand conflicts, the solver uh, comes back to the user, even if there's no 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 solution, even if it doesn't know if the formula is satisfied or not. Sorry. It just uh, Okay, run, run, find a solution or abort after a thousand conflict and release yes. control back to me. Yeah, yeah, that's what it does. It's good if you have like, again, in optimization uh, queries, you want to find, uh, to work locally, to to make kind of a local search using a SAT server. So you, 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 you're doing many, many, many queries, but you want them to abort at some point. You want them to be rapid. So that's the idea. It is either that you find, quickly find a model nearby, or, or uh, if you don't, you just want to, to, to test another option. Uh, what about restarts? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about restarts. Okay. I think it's it's a next, next slide, probably. So that's like an excellent question. Or maybe the slide after one. OK, uh, so yeah, this slide is about complete analysis. So what I do there. I record the standard first API clause enhanced by uh, minimization, binary resolution, and on the fly subsumption. I think all of them are used by KISA too. And then uh, there is this um, uh, flip recording idea. Uh, so the last, latest flip first API clause is the first API clause with respect to fake decision level created by marking the latest literal flip by conflict analysis decision. So when you flip a literal by conflict analysis, you can uh, consider that literal a decision literal. Essentially, that's what Grasp did back then. So if you flip a literal, it's considered to be a decision literal still. And then you record the clause with respect to that literal, as if that literal was a decision literal, OK? So um, I published a paper about it like many years ago, and then another paper. Uh, it didn't make, this idea did not make it to the, uh, so this is a clause that you will see on the way to the first UIP, right? Yes, you will see it on the way to the first UIP, exactly. OK, and you can keep sure. OK, mm -hmm. yes. OK, and you're and, saying uh, you, you, you want to keep that and maybe learn that too, is what you're saying? I, yeah, I would, yeah, yeah. So the, this technique keeps that clause and learns it too. But the key thing which I wanted to, uh, to, to, to emphasize here is that it is really essential to check whether that clause is subsumed or not by the first UIP clause. And if it is subsumed, do not learn it. That makes a huge difference. So that, that's, that's my point here. I did not try it on, on uh, SAT competition instances. I did not try it in KISAT. But um, I think there is a hope that this idea would actually improve the state of the art. Now, after this, uh, you know, 
uh, this improvement of bio filtering out um, capsule clues. Do you have any nice story to tell why the LF first UIP would be a good clause? You know, I, I do have a story to tell, but I think I'll skip it for today because it's like I have a presentation about it, but. Uh, not just yeah. a short story, but a, a whole short story. story. Like a short story that it's, it, you know, again, um, yeah, I, I should have, I have a, a nice figure, I think, about it. So the thing is that the closed learning is kind of uneven. So you learn every, so if you imagine a tree, imagine a tree, you have a, um, a leftmost path, to the leaf and the rightmost path of the leaf. And then, uh, you know what, maybe I'll go to the first slide. I have something similar, something maybe helpful there. Here, for example. You have this tree. So um, just ignore, ignore, ignore that this is a satisfiable formula, but uh, so you would learn a clause. So assume that all these these are all uh, decisions. So you will learn a clause for every decision for the polarity zero for A, B, and C. So you you will learn a clause for uh, the first IP clause with respect to C, and you would flip C. You you would learn the first IP clause with respect to B. You would flip B. Right. And so, but but. It's very biased by the phase. If you pick the in the first phase, it would be one for every variable. Okay, then you would you would have learned a totally different set of clauses. But you you would you you would have learned first UAP clauses with respect to T, B, and A, and they are all assigned one, which would be a different set of clauses. And what this uh, technique does, it likes uh, it makes uh, the polarity selection less. Uh, let's say the close learning does not depend so much now on the polarity selection. So you can think yeah, of okay, okay. It's a so, sort of yeah, you're deciding it to true and false in parallel in some vague sense and getting something like that. Yes. So that's that's the, the vague idea. Yeah. No, that's a story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, Alex, do you want to comment more on the um, different heuristics that you get for these queries? Which heuristics? Um, you said that you tune the heuristics for different kind of queries. Um, yeah. So uh, what the difference are? Mm. Yeah, I'll talk about it, like about the heuristics oh, you'll themselves. Talk about it. Okay, we yeah. lost for a minute, so we thought you just went over it. Okay, <laughs> then, yeah. All right, that will be covered. Yeah. And so for example, here. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, this is, about the decision heuristic with incremental score reboot. And this heuristic is um, actually, is, it's tuned by, by query type. So um, Intelsat applies this EVS ADS, which is a standard heuristic. Now, um, it was introduced in Minisat. Updates, in Minisat updates scores of variables by adding this factor, one divided by F uh, to the power of I, where I is the conflict index, right? So uh, now F, is always uh, less than one. Because of that, th there is a more impact to recent clauses. So in glucose, F goes from uh, eight to, sorry, 0 0.8 to 0 0.95, increased by um, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Okay? And in Intelsat, the heuristic is more stable. Now, if you go from 0 0.8, then you change the scores more rapidly. Uh, as compared to 0 0.95. Right? So uh, in Intersat, the decline is slower, so it's more stable because we want to stay close kind of to satisfying assignments, something like that. And and here is the incremental score reboot heuristic in Intersat. So what I do here is I reinitialize F 0 0.95. That's it. On every normal incremental query, but only for non normal incremental queries. I don't do it for uh, this uh, quick, rapid... Uh, queries, uh, short queries, but only for the long ones or, or supposedly long ones. Uh, what it does, it, it increases the scores by a larger factor at the beginning, such queries, which simulate score reboot. 
okay, and observe the query driven theory here. So I do it only for normal incremental queries rather, the, rather than the quick queries, because here I assume that the, the formula might have changed. There is some new incremental information and the user wants to want to invest time, uh, you know, to learn something from the new clauses. Uh, and so it could make sense to, to give them more weight, to give weight to recent COVID, to recent clauses at this point. That's the idea. Okay. Now uh, let me explain what I do for backtracking and restarting. So um, what I do essentially is a score-based backtracking, like in Cadical, in the back backing backtracking paper by Sibylle and Armin. So I backtrack to the level containing the variable with the highest EVS IDS score. So uh, I think I, I had a discussion with Armin and uh, Armin told me that Kisa doesn't do that, but uh, Cadical does. And so with Intelsat, I checked and it, it turned out to be the, the best working scheme on Max, at least on, on the Max, uh, Maxet um, benchmark. Uh, so what I do is applying score-based backtracking uh, depending of the on on the difference between the current level and the backtrack level okay if it is higher than than some threshold t i apply score based backtracking otherwise i apply just non chronological backtracking okay so locally i apply non chronological backtracking if 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 the if the back jump is not that high otherwise um, it's score based backtracking and the t is again determined based on query driven tuning so it's essentially zero for normal incremental queries so in normal incremental queries, I always use scroll-based backtracking and uh, no, never non crucial backtracking. It's 100 for initial and short incremental queries. Now, if you ask me whether I have a good intuition of why that these values work the best, I'm afraid that I don't actually. I'm not sure. This is just something I just determined experimentally. Okay, but again, I have these experiments and uh, I will show you that um, differentiating between these different type of queries actually um, makes a difference in practice. So this is just something else to consider when you when you, you know design an incremental subset. And then uh, when it comes to restarting, what I do is local restarts okay, on top of, uh, so that there was a paper by Vadim and Ofer Strichman, on top of the, just a simple arithmetic restart strategy with a conflict threshold uh, of 1,000. So I don't do anything fancy. Again, this is a very slow restarting strategy. Local research, they depend on the level, uh, how long you, you stayed uh, below a certain level. If you start, if you stayed below a certain level for, um, in this case, 1,000 complex, you restart. That's the idea. So a rapid research uh, do not work well, or at least not on unweighted max of instances. On weighted instances, by the way, uh, you know, glucose-based rapid resistance work better. But um, for unweighted maxet and also my industrial application, that's the best thing. Okay. So we now come again to experimental results, but now I will just emphasize the, um, the impact of the new heuristics. Okay, so that's um, again, uh, setup. So uh, let's go to, to the different configurations of um, T21i. Yeah. Alex, yes. uh, quick question. Um, so uh, I think for one thing you showed that how uh, the initial and uh, the frequent restart are similar. Is that a normal, uh, sorry, um, the query with the, you know, uh -huh. fixed conflict are similar. Is that a normal observation or? Uh, no. No, it just turned out to be like this for this particular heuristic. Normally, they are different. It's not like uh, not something happening often or something like that. Just yeah. Okay, can you see? I yeah, I mean we have some, and in some of the recent work we have exactly these kind of queries. So that's why I'm interested. Like, can you say more about if you found difference between initial and uh, Queries with a fixed conflict. Yeah, you know, if you have an application with, which does tweaking uh, satisfiable queries, you can, you know, just try the sets of them. Just try into set. And then you will have like everything there. Uh, but 
or otherwise you can try and tune the heuristics and go in and see what kind of uh, values work best for your application. But what I found you know, in many heuristics, not only those I, I, I mentioned here, is that it makes uh, sense to, to differentiate between these different queries. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, here I, I used, so again, these are the same experimental results I've already shown, but I just want to, um, tell you something about this um, configurations in terms of new heuristics. So I have several configurations. How ILB enables incremental lazy backtracking, just backtracking to zero for every solver net close. No FLP disables the flip recording. This one disables subsumption based flip close filtering. So there is flip recording, but no filtering. This one disables incremental score reboot. And then there are two backtracking um, um, oriented heuristics, which apply backtracking with same value of T for all the queries. So for backtracking, the query-driven tuning is disabled. So let's take a look again at the same results. So let's just look at, uh, at the um, different configurations of T21i. So you can see that ILB is crucial. So if you look at timeout 300 for uh, the market version 20 and also 21 benchmarks, you can see that without ILB results are way lower, right? Then flip recording is always helpful and, and filtering is essential. So again, here the impact is not that big, but here it's it's huge. Then uh, the filtering is really helpful for max 20 instances here. You can see the difference. Not so for 21 instances. Uh, then uh, incremental score reboot again is helpful both here and here. Uh, and um, then if you turn off query even, even tuning for for backtracking, then the results go down for both sets of benchmarks. So uh, this is just to show you that the, that you know these heuristics work in practice. So. Uh, to conclude my talk, I introduced a new SAT solver, relatively new SAT solver called Intel SAT solver. It's written from scratch in C20, and it was officially released by Intel under MIT license. So it's free and it's optimized for multi satisfiable incremental queries. I introduced a new core SAT algorithm called the implication. It enables incremental lazy backtracking, but also it allows one to restore two invariants broken by chronological backtracking, lowest implication, lowest conflict. And there are some new listings, including query-driven tuning, subsumption-based flip close filtering, and incremental score reboots. And uh, then in the experimental results section, we have seen that it improves the state of the art in unweighted anytime max. So that's all I want to tell you today. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much. So I'm applauding on behalf of all of the audience. This is <laughs> fantastic. And we've already, you know, you have entertained us for a very long time now, over two hours. But still, are there any final, final questions, maybe, from the audience? We wrap yes. Up? yes. So you must have. Oh, sorry. Andrew was first. I've never asked something. Uh, yes. Yeah, so just saying, what's the advantage of max at? If I'm just counting up to, say, 840 variables, just using a sorting network and the standard SAT solver, how does that compare against using MaxSat? It, that's really, I mean, MaxSat, modern MaxSat solvers are way better. So it, it uh, there are so many, th there is much improvement, so it won't work well, just, just doing a sorting network. Okay. Um, yes, for more limited cases, it, it worked well enough just to, to find slightly better solutions. But that's interesting. It just gave me more choice of SAT solvers because then I could try every SAT solver rather than the ones which were just max SAT. You mean you have your own implementation uh, of uh, max SAT using these networks and you want to use different, different SAT solvers? It, it, it might be able to count some variables up to 840 of them. And I just use a encode counting them with a sorting network and then mm -hmm. just. Um, see how many have been set well i mean if it works well enough for your application then uh, then it works 
Otherwise, you can, of course, try max at solvers, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I had a question because you have this last slide open. So did, did you try it on other types of problems like BMC where it's the opposite? So you usually end up yeah. with very hard unsat queries. And... Yeah, and I did not try it on BMC, try it on BMC because at Intel now I'm, of course, concentrating on optimization problems, but I suspect it wouldn't work well on BMC because I don't have any processing. And so, uh, you know, yeah, in BMC, all, although it's incremental, I believe that non-incremental techniques would work well there. So. Uh, I don't think it will be competitive without processing there. And also not for equivalence checking, like combination equivalence checking or something? Um, it, I mean, if you do your checking somehow, you, if you if you divide the problem, divide and conquer them, maybe. If you just you know throw the whole problem into SAT solver, then you must have in processing. Right? Without in processing, it works well. On optimization problems, so you have uh, your even if it's a huge problem, you find your first solution, and then you improve it in quick, you know, rapid queries. There, it works well. That was why that was why I, I you know, brought it from, from. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? So then I think we'll, we'll again thank you so much, Alex, for this this wonderful presentation. Um, thank you very much. It was, uh, it was just great. Thank you so much.